When it comes to easily identifiable trees, the catalpa is near the top of the list with their distinctive growth form, large leaves, showy blooms, and unique seed pods. They are hard to forget. While these trees are beautiful, are they the best choice for your yard? Well, maybe, maybe not. But to understand why, we must learn a little more about the catalpas. Notice I said catalpas. There are two species of catalpa native to eastern North America. The northern catalpa, catalpa speciosa, which has a native range in the mid-south, up through Illinois and Indiana, and the southern catalpa, catalpa bignonioides, which is found natively in the Gulf Coast states. Although their natural ranges do not overlap, both species are quite adaptable and have been planted across the eastern United States, so you may encounter either species just about anywhere which is why it's important to be able to tell them apart. If you love trees, and I know you do, think of that like button as a big old distinguished catalpa and give it a hug. There are plenty of similarities between the northern and southern catalpas. Both have large, heart-shaped leaves that have an opposite or world arrangement on the stem. They both have large, showy, fragrant white blooms with yellow and purple highlights. The southern catalpa tends to bloom later in the season but there is overlap in the species bloom periods. Both have the distinctive long bean-shaped pods catalpas are famous for, and both are found growing naturally in moist, well-drained soils in full sun to partial shade. However, both species are highly adaptable and can grow in drier soils, are drought tolerant, flood tolerant, and are highly tolerant of pollution. This is one of the reasons they have been planted widely in cities and along roads. Due to their large leaves and form, they also make excellent shade trees. As similar as they are, there are differences between the species, size being one of them. The northern catalpa is a larger tree that will grow from 40 to 70 feet tall with a 20 to 50 foot crown spread. Southern catalpa is a bit shorter with a 30 to 60 foot height, but tends to have more crown spread for its size and can be 20 to 50 feet wide. The quickest way to tell them apart is by smelling a crushed up leaf. The leaves of southern catalpa have a disagreeable scent, those of northern catalpa have no real scent to them. The growth forms of the species differ also. Northern catalpa tend to have a taller, straighter trunk, and southern catalpa usually has a shorter, squat, and twisted trunk. The mature bark is also quite different, with northern catalpa having furrowed gray bark, and southern catalpa having gray, flaking, scale-like bark. Now that we can tell them apart, let's talk about their use by pollinators. The fragrant blooms are mainly pollinated by bumblebees, large carpenter bees, and moths, but are visited by a wide assortment of pollinators, and catalpas are especially attractive to honeybees, even when they're not flowering, which we'll get to in a minute. The catalpas are also the sole host plant for something else they are famous for, the caterpillars of the catalpa sphinx moth. These moths lay large numbers of eggs in masses known as rafts, and tons of these moths will lay their eggs on the same tree resulting in an army of caterpillars that may totally defoliate the tree. While this sounds grim for the tree, they are adapted to it and will regrow their leaves within about a month if they are defoliated. The caterpillars of another sphinx moth, the Tursa sphinx moth, will also utilize catalpa as a host plant, but to nowhere near the numbers of the catalpa sphinx. All those catalpa sphinx moth caterpillars, what are commonly called catalpa worms, chewing on the leaves sets an interesting food chain into motion. Catalpa trees have extra floral nectaries on the lower surface of the leaves, places where nectar is produced without flowers, and are the reason you can often hear honeybees buzzing on catalpas in the heat of summer. When the caterpillars commence their attack on the leaves, the nectaries near the damaged areas start producing more nectar. That nectar in turn attracts insects beneficial to the catalpa's cause, mainly ants and parasitoid wasps, which will help deal with the caterpillar attackers. The parasitoid wasp come to the nectar and then lay their eggs on the numerous catalpa worms, which when they hatch, will produce larvae that will consume the catalpa worm alive. Super awesome for us nature nerds, not so much for the catalpa worm. Birds do not eat many catalpa worms as they taste bad. Plus they have a regurgitation defense mechanism, which makes them taste even worse. The yellow-billed cuckoo, a caterpillar specialist, doesn't care and eats them anyway. Interestingly, some trees seem to never have catalpa worms and others are covered with them every year. Catalpa worms are also prized in some areas because they make great fish bait. All species of fish seem to be drawn to them and the goo they puke up that birds find nasty, fish seem to love. And there is no better summer bait for catfish than the catalpa worm. 
In some areas, catalpa trees are planted for the sole purpose of producing catalpa worms for bait. If you like to fish, having a ready source of one of the best baits around is a great reason to plant a catalpa tree. If you would like to learn more about growing catalpa trees for catalpa worm production, there is an informative book that I will link in the description. I would like to take a moment and thank those that have helped the channel grow by subscribing, and also thank those that have gone above and beyond by financially supporting the channel through our Patreon and PayPal donate. For those of you who would like to join them in supporting the channel, there are links to our Patreon and PayPal donate in the description. We also now have super thanks enabled on the channel, and the link to that can be found right below this video, kind of in that area, right there. Thank you for your support. Now that we have looked at the pluses of having a catalpa tree in your yard, it's time to look at the negatives of having one. And there's quite a few of them. First and foremost, catalpas can be messy with a capital M. They have a heavy leaf drop in the fall, their large blooms cover the ground with a blanket of petals when done flowering. The large seed pods are numerous and take quite a while to break down. And when a tree is heavily infested with catalpa worms, it can sound like rain below the tree from all the frass falling. Frass is entomology nerds speak for caterpillar poop. If that isn't enough, the wood of catalpa is brittle and weak, which means they are constantly losing twigs and small branches. In heavy winds, ice or snow load, they can lose large branches, making them a hazard to buildings and power lines. A quick side note, even though the wood isn't strong, the heartwood is incredibly rot resistant and catalpa was a source of fence post and railroad ties in days gone by. Now back to our list. And last, there's the mature size of these trees. They get big, not only tall, but wide. It takes a large chunk of land to house the average catalpa tree. If you have a large space and don't mind the mess that catalpa creates, they are a super cool native for a specimen or shade tree. Just be sure to keep them far enough away from buildings and power lines so there aren't issues when the tree matures. They are also great to have around if you like to fish as there is a good supply of catalpa worms most summers. In the average city home lot, I would not recommend a large tree like the catalpa and would encourage the planting of a smaller specimen tree, such as those I recommend in this video. And be sure to get out and explore nature in your backyard.